So, uh, this symbol is a Greek lambda letter, and it looks like a Half-Life game sign, but it's not only this, uh, because it's a sacred holy sign of functional programming. And if you see it somewhere, huge chances that you see something related to functional programming. It's because the functional programming is heavily influenced by lambda calculus. It's the term from mathematics. I won't dive deep today into mathematics, but in short, lamb, it, uh, the main uh, idea behind lambda calculus is the lambda expression. And lambda expression is the anonymous function self-evaluated anonymous function, let's say so, in terms of JavaScript. So, about the functional programming. Oh yeah, and you can see that it's really, really old concept. Let's see, uh, 1930s, and it's really old thing, and you will see that overall functional programming is based on the mathematical uh, uh, ideas that formed at the beginning of last century. And they are really old comparing to, for example, object-oriented concepts that we have uh, around these days. And this means not only outdated, but also that it was, it was tested by time, you know. I will return to this. So what, why do I even need this? Why do I need the functional programming? Why, why is such uh, hype uh, around this? And you see that Angular and React promote these ideas. Why is it so? Why even Vue.js has some functional components? And I already know object-oriented programming. Why do I need anything else? So, did you have this kind of situation? Bug fix takes much more time than you expected. It's hard to catch it. The root cause is hard to find because of tangled code. Something changed somewhere, but you don't know where exactly. Events of events that change the state, for example, of your component, of your application. And if the order of those events change, if everything just breaks. And it could be caused by, for example, slower network connection. I'm also sure that you're aware about this uh, in practical, uh, in practice, you encountered this. You have to do clone all the time to protect the state. Clone here is taken from Lodash. And yeah, it's a common anti-pattern in our gut front-end uh, when the developers uh, try to use the clone because they see that the object gets mutated somewhere and they don't know where exactly. And to protect the state of their component, they try to, well, they use clone to create a copy of that object and use this copy. And that's, a, that's an anti-pattern and I will show later how to avoid this. You need to restore the state either by URL or from local storage or implement undo redo functionality and it's just unreal in your application. If you tried to do undo redo without the functional approaches such as Redux immutable store, you know the pain that I'm talking about. And also if you need to restore something from the URL, uh, you also understand me. To mock the dependency in your test takes so much effort that it's better just to not write the test at all. Yeah, uh, I don't know, uh, the developers don't like to write tests usually because it takes some time, you need to think about how to mock stuff and your code needs, needs to be testable uh, and it should be easy to test. It should bring you joy uh, when you test testing your code and usually it's unfortunately not the case. Functional programming helps us here. I will show you how. You can't understand what's going on. I'm pretty sure that you, yeah, you encountered this problem. Programming brings no joy and you dream about the new clean project to start from scratch. Yeah, 
you get a feeling that everything can be better, simpler, more convenient, more compact. Yeah, and that's actually the intuition that you have that it could be better, it's true, but you just have to rethink the problem that we have. So what's the problem? What is modern web UI? It's the state and events. So your application has certain state and certain events that change that state. The state has this problem, is the shared mutable state. So for example, we have an hierarchy of components and some of them take the state from other components and mutate that state. And this state is shared for them but they mutated. So it's a shared mutable state. And when they do this, it's really, really hard to figure out what, what happened, which component changed the state and so on. Uh, and the events problem, the callback how. So you say that, okay, when this event happened, uh, you want to call this function. And when in this function, this event happened, you want to call this one and then you want to make a request to HTTP and wait for the answer and you just get lost in those callbacks. Of course, this is over complicated example, but you, you get the idea. Also, we need our code should be easy to read and understand. We need the re reusability and modularity so that we can separate certain uh, parts of our application uh, and yeah. They should, everything should be as compact as possible and it should be easy to test, which is related to modularity actually. Yeah, easy to test means that you can separate something and your application is composed out of building blocks uh, or units. Every, uh, each of one uh, is independent from others. And yeah, the modern web UI is the challenge for us because the UI has never been so complex. So much of state, so much of events. Yeah, we have a lot of state and a lot of events. And actually this brought the community to uh, the need to search for a new ways to solve this, those problems of complex, really complex UIs that we have these days. And it led everybody to uh, open the functional programming, reopen it, reborn it. Because I say reborn because actually that's something really, really old. And for example, we have the Lisp classical programming language. Uh, it's functional, classical functional language. And it's 60 years old. Comparing to Java, which uh, emerged some in 90s and yeah some 20 years ago it's really really old and it's actually great okay so how does it relate to javascript javascript is a multi-paradigm language let's take a look at wiki and it says that yeah it's uh oh yeah where is it yeah, multi-paradigm, object-oriented, imperative, uh, and event-driven. Well, imperative, I, I wouldn't say so, because we can use not only imperative approaches here. But uh, if you take a look at the history, Brandon Icke, uh, the first goal of Brandon Icke was to embed the scheme programming language into the browser. And the scheme is actually a dialect of Lisp. Again, you can see the lambda sign here. So it's a multi-paradigm language, but initially it's designed as functional. It was a scheme from, for browser. But then, yeah, then uh, it was the days when Java, uh, Sun uh, released Java and Java was really popular thing and they decide to rename the project and use this name in this new browser's language, 
and they decided to name it JavaScript just by coincidence because actually JavaScript has no relation with Java at all. Okay, so yes, it's also object-oriented, but in the JavaScript, the object-oriented approach is prototype-based in contrast to traditional class-based object-oriented languages such as Java. So if you even use stuff like classes in JavaScript, please don't uh, miss much, misunderstand this. It's not the, they are not the classes under the hood. More on that later. Okay, let's take a look at classical object-oriented languages first. How does object-oriented programming solve the problem of shared mutable state that we discussed? Inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. This is the mantra that everybody knows. Yeah, we have certain hierarchy of types or classes. And yeah, we have the public and private uh, mutators. Oh, no, not, not mutators. Uh, ac accessibility, let's say so. And yeah, this solely to protect the state of those objects that will be created. And this class is the main form of abstraction in object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming encourages the imperative, imperative approach of writing the program. Imperative means that we describe how to do stuff instead of uh, what exactly we need to do. Mutable state of objects gets protected through encapsulation uh, or yeah, those uh, public private uh, access keywords, right? So we can access the state only through the arbitrary methods. Not to break anything. We are constantly uh, afraid of breaking anything. That's why we use this encapsulation. Data gets mixed with behavior because we have the functions that are tied to concrete objects as the class me methods. So we have the the methods are actually functions, right? But they so tightly coupled to the data or to the classes, it's the tightest coupling that can be actually. And this is a root of so much of problems while designing software. What if not every child should inherit some behavior? Another hierarchy, architectural questions that actually they can be avoided in reality. Uh, most of the time. I will show you how. So we have many various that data types that are tightly coupled with functions. For example, in Java we have array list, linked list, double linked list, copy and write array list and so on. So we have a lot, a lot of that data types. They inherit one other. We have this whole hierarchy of data types and every has, every one of them has tightly coupled methods or functions that are tightly coupled to these data types. So what, on the other hand, we have in the functional programming approach? Function is the main form of abstraction in functional programming paradigm in mathematical sense. And if you think about this, actually, function is the, uh, is the most fundamental thing in programming because actually all programming all that we deal with in programming is the composition of functions. Even in object-oriented programming, well, we need to make a shift in our minds that class is just a way to express ourselves and it's just a design pattern. But behind the classes, we always have the functions and functionality which we want to connect in certain ways and uh, yeah, so compose. So functional programming brings the programming closer to mathematics because fun we treat functions as mathematical functions. So in functional programming, there is no need to protect state. How? More on that later, I will tell you, tell you about this. So imagine if you don't need to protect your state at all, you're always, you're always sure that your state is totally protected. It's immutable. It's, uh, impossible to mute the state. So you don't need no uh, pu public private accessor keywords. You don't need 
to, uh, to create getters or setters and so on. Your state is always safe. It leads to significant reduce of amount of hidden box also. Of course, because there is no shared state. Uh, your state is always immutable. There is shared state, but it's immutable and you don't need to figure out who changed it because you always know what, how, how this happened. I, I will show it. Uh, behavior is clearly separated from data. We have separate functions that work on various data types and it's much easier to, to reuse and support. It's just functions. So you don't have the object that, are, that has the uh, methods uh, and functions that bound to those objects. You have just functions that can operate on certain limited uh, set of types. No questions about inheritance and type hierarchy. You just doesn't, don't bother about this. Uh, functional programming encourages declarativeness. Uh, it's the uh, opposite of imperativeness. And we described what we want to do and not how it should be done. And lead, it, it leads to higher abstraction and it leads to code that is easier to read, reason about and understand. Many functions not tied to concrete data types and can operate with anything that fits the interface. Again, we have just functions, just functions. It's really cool. Uh, you just need to get the idea. So uh, yeah, I took this from the book. I'm not sure with whether it's legal, but <laughs> okay. So uh, JavaScript is multi-paradigm and we can actually use this power of combining functional and object oriented in JavaScript. So functional promotes the use of decoupled standalone functions <laughs> and object oriented promotes creation of specialized, specialized <coughs> types. Uh, yeah. uh, logically connecting many data types with specialized behavior. So we can find the sweet spot here between the object oriented and functional oriented in, in, in functional programming in JavaScript and use it. Uh, well, yeah, so we can use both object oriented and functional approaches. And recently we can observe the popularity growth of functional programming because React is huge, heavily influenced by functional concepts. Uh, Redux is totally based on functional. Immutable GS from React team is uh, promotes the immutable uh, data structures from functional programming. RxJS is functional reactive library uh, embraced, leveraged by Angular these days. And yeah, it's really, really cool. Elm, it's the functional language used to build the uh, web applications, not in scope of our discussion today. Clojure script is also the technology for building the front end using Lisp. And on the back end, we have Scala, F Sharp, and I believe they have the functional stuff in Java and PHP and everywhere these days. Okay, so let's dive deeper into functional programming. Why is it so cool? Uh, for this, I have my functional programming uh, reference that I wrote. Uh, it's a quick start guide on functional programming. Of course, it's not enough, but it's enough to get started with this. So let's take it step by step. So I already said about imperative versus declarative. Here you can see the imperative way to uh, writing our applications. We all used to it uh, when writing, I don't know, Java applications, for example, I don't know. So for cycle is, uh, for loop is a classical imperative form of expressing yourself. So here we have the array and then we want to transform every element in this array somehow. And compare this to this, when we say we have an array and we map it to certain function. So we transform it and by 
using the map word here, we express the uh, type of this transformation. So it's the declarative way of doing the same thing. Here we say how we do this. And here we say what exactly we do. And just abstracting out from the uh, concrete implementation how to do this. Of course, you can achieve this in imperative programming also by uh, you know, extracting the function, but in functional programming, it's just the core idea. So declarativeness, you can see how, what exactly you do by just looking. And it, it to that extent that you read it as just as you would read the text. So to proceed on this idea, we need to cover some basic stuff from functional world is the higher order function. So higher order functions are the functions that can take other functions as arguments or return other uh, functions. So here you can see how I map the get h function that return the h uh, from the users array, let's say. So this map is the higher order function because it takes the get h uh, function as an argument. It's really cool. In JavaScript, it's built into the language and it makes JavaScript actually functional friendly, let's say so. Okay, now let's say that, okay, first of all, uh, we use low dash. I hope that you know low dash. It's the tool belt to uh, manipulate on collections in first place, but not on this. Uh, some other stuff, mainly collections and objects. So they have this functional programming also part also, Lodash FP. Lodash FP module promotes more functional programming friendly style by, yeah, I won't read the uh, part there, not to make it more complex. Okay, so uh, I will demonstrate to you the concept that we will talk about on this Ramda library. It's also that uh, low dash FP is hugely influenced by, by Ramda, and actually they just copy stuff from Ramda. And yeah, it's also Lambda, as you can see, and this sign reminds of the Lambda sign that you already know. So Lambda is really cool because it's built, it's like low dash, but it's built with the functional programming in mind. And they have this cool uh, uh, interface, which I can use to demonstrate stuff right away here in my browser. So let's try out, I don't know, the partially applied functions. So we, we talked about higher order functions. Now the next step is partially applied functions. Let's say that I have a certain uh, array of users and they have names and they have ages, age. Okay, and another one. Okay. So, what if I want to get some property of, what if I want to transform this array to the array of ages? I want to pick just the ages. I will do it like this map. Oh, well, okay, user, user, age, and pass the users there and output the ages. Okay, it works. So uh, what if I want to, uh, let me think about it. Okay, let's say that I have more users. And now let's say that I want to get users that are older than certain age. Uh, okay, I will use 
filter, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so the filter works. It's another example of higher order functions. So uh, regarding the partially applied function, let's say that we have also the company for which the, every user works. Let's say, yeah, CGM. And this one will also be CGM. And this one will be Microsoft, let's say. Okay, so now I want to pick only the, let me think about it. Okay, let's say that I have the uh, function that will create the user. It will take the name and the company and produce some user with this name and this company as an object. And now I want to create the user for CGM, let's say. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, it works. And now I want to reuse this function to create more users. Okay, it works also. But what if I want to Let's switch the arguments here because I'm interested in company more than a name of the user. And let's say that I want to create a lot of CGM users. So I want to create the function that will reuse this create function user, but it will always pass the uh, first argument for this function. So it will be... CGM and the function that I want to reuse. And then I will use it here and pass only the name. Oh yeah. And for this, I will use the partial function from Ramda. And it's actually, what what is it made for? It's made for, so it, can, it can pass certain arguments uh, and remember them and then reuse this function uh, across the application. So this is how actually I can reuse my functions. And here I have the also similar uh, example how I can reuse this. But uh, we also have the technique that is called curry and it's named after the famous uh, mathematician uh, Haskell Curry. Uh, Haskell Curry also uh, he influenced the functional concepts very much. And despite the fact that he did this in a mathem mathematical world, uh, yeah, let's Curry. And yeah, Haskell functional language Haskell is also named after him. So it's a really, really cool guy. Okay, so we have this technique that's called curry. Let's try it out. It makes my function automatically uh, 
uh, automatically ready to be reused in this way, in partially applied way. So if I call this uh, curry method function on any of my functions, I can then uh, partially call this function and it will be executed only when I pass all the arguments. Let me demonstrate this idea. So let's say that I curry this my function of creating the user. And then I just say that create CGM user will be actually create user with the first argument CGM. And it will just work. And then I can, so for example, let's take another example. I have a function uh, sum and it takes two or uh, three arguments and it returns the sum of those three arguments. And let's take a look how it works. So we have this sum function and we call it with one, two, two, three, right? And it works. Then I want, I can do it like this, for example. It also work. The, let me, yeah, everything is fine, I guess. Why, 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 why? Oh yeah, I need to curry it, I forgot. So I curry this function and then it works and I can call it even like this. So when I, when I call it with only first argument, it returns the function that takes two more arguments. B and C. And when I call it with second argument, I get the function that will that uh, waits for the last argument. And when I pass the last argument like this or like this, I get the result. So function is evaluated and I get the result. Really cool. And we actually can use it to uh, uh, structure our applications, break it up into uh, smaller functions and combine them using the function composition about which I will talk later. So, for example, we can use it like if we have the, this function that takes certain user from database since uh, some time, like, and I need to pass the database name, the user ID and the time uh, from which I need to start, I can uh, curry it and pass just the database name or just the database name and user ID and then yeah you can imagine that I can uh, reuse it okay so we have it's basically it's it about curry but it's technique that we use a lot in uh, got front end and actually what's cool about uh, low dash FP and Ramda as well is that all the methods, all the functions that they have there are by default already carried for you. So for example, if I have this, let's, let me get back. If I have this, no, okay. Let's say that I have the user array. Uh, yeah, name. H, some more, oops, okay, and I want to take guys that are older than 30. And then uh, I will use filter. Uh, yeah, user a user H is greater than thirty. And then I you can see that I passed only the function in the filter. I didn't pass the users there. So it's carried and it waits for the second argument to pass. And then I just call the resulting function with 
the array that I want to. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, it works. And then works. Okay, so everything, all the functions that we have in low dash, if we are carried right away for you, and that's really great. I won't stop uh, on my math filter and reduce, and I assume that you understand those three basic functions that we have in low dash, and actually they are standards in JavaScript. So I encourage you to read about this as much as you can, especially about reduce, because it's really, really powerful function, and sometimes developers just don't understand what, why, what, what it's about. So it would be really, really helpful for you. And those functions actually, they are of course higher order functions and they help us very much to achieve that goal of declarativeness in our code. You can compare this imperative way of expressing ourselves. So we, I don't know what happens here. It's really hard to figure out. I have to read this, right? Uh, dive deeply and here we have the same exact functionality and I can actually say this by just reading array filter item which has the flag and the type is equals to it equals to this type so they are totally identical but the second one is declarative thanks to filter so you can use map filter and reduce to express your intent. In this case, I express my intent to filter the collection. <clears throat> okay, let's skip. Uh, now about pure functions and side effects. In functional programming, we strive to write pure functions. Pure function is the function that only takes something and returns something. So it only takes its arguments, change or transform it, transforms it somehow and just returns the result. It doesn't change the outer world in any way. So for example, if you have a function, uh, I have the user and I have the function, certain function, and it takes the user and then it takes uh, user h and mutates it. And then some function. And then I call this some function on you. So let's take a look at the user now. Okay, it's fine. And then I call this some function on user and take a look at the user now and the age is changed and it's really really not, not not good because looking at this i can say i can't say where exactly what exactly ch was changed in this function and it's it's hard to figure out for me what's go what's going on this function can change the whole state of my application inside of it and it can, it can change the state of user inside of it and it, it, it's the root cause of all the problems that we have in front-end development these days. So taking a look at this code, how could you figure out if the property, this property was changed somehow in one of these method calls? So I have three method calls here and how can I figure out whether I can, uh, whether this property was changed It's impossible. I need to dive, uh, open every line of, you know, open every method and observe it. And let's say that it was changed in action two method. I can see that this property was changed here. So I can like extract this out into so-called pure function. It takes only the some flag and well, some argument and returns something. And here I have some methods and then explicitly change this property and it's obvious to the reader that this property was changed it's not the best example but 
you can uh, I, I hope that you understand what, what I'm talking about. So here how our functions uh, function look our uh, pure function. It just takes some arguments and returns some result. And inside of it, we have the transformation on those arguments and nothing else you can see that there are no uh, er arrows to something outside of this function. So everything is encapsulated inside of this function. We have the inputs, transformation and outputs. And this pattern of inputs, transformation and outputs, it will uh, repeat itself a lot, a lot, a lot while we move on. Also, we have the notion of immutability in functional programming. So to emphasize this need of the state to be immutable and for us to be obvious that we change something, in classical functional programming languages, there, is, uh, there are immutable data structures. Uh, so like arrays or objects that are impossible to mutate in this way. You always need to return something new instead of creating this. So in JavaScript, unfortunately, there is no such thing as uh, immutable uh, data structures out of the box. Here is an example. So we have the uh, function that source, sorts the uh, array in this descending order. And you can see it takes array and calls the standard native sort uh, method. And that's it, it returns this sorted array, right? And I have the array and I call this sort descending uh, function on this array. And I taking a look at the reverse. Yes, it's reversed. And then I'm taking a look at the array that was initially, and it's also reversed because this sort method actually mutates this array. And it's really, really frustrating for uh, developer because it's really hard to figure out that, whoa, oh yeah, this sort mutates this. And actually we can avoid this uh, in JavaScript, but we have to obey certain rules. First of all, you notice that we always use the const constant keyword to express that this is something that won't change later in the code. And if you have a variable that is going to change, please use let or no, no var please, because let is uh, lexically scoped and it's really so only const or let's and const is really preferable because when I see that something is constant, I know that it won't change in the future. So let's get back to our example. And for example, uh, I want to mutate the state of this user, but just returning the and here how it looks in ECMAScript 6, we have the spread operator that will take the object and spread it out into the new object. So uh, the new object will take all the, the keys that the old object has. And then we want to change the age and it will be the same as the age of the old user, but plus one. So we have Okay, and we have the result of calling this function new user. So, uh, yeah, like this. And let's take a look. And it's, yeah, it's mutated, but the original user is immutable and it didn't change because, yeah, we use this technique. And actually, there are techniques to, for example, mutate the inner. Uh, parts of the objects and mutate the arrays. I provide all these techniques here. So the array is the same as you, as you have seen. Uh, it, for example, sort mutates the array. And but you can uh, avoid this by using certain techniques in JavaScript. And please use them as much as you can, uh, and make sure that your objects and arrays are immutable. So now about the function composition. It's the most interesting part. Let's get back to our user's example. And yeah, let's say that 
I want to find the names of all the users that are older than 30. Here comes the interesting part because in functional programming we have a notion of composition, function composition or the piping. So for example, if we have a lot of functions and we want to call the first function on certain argument, then result would be uh, called, uh, the new function will be applied to result, and then the new function will be applied to result, and so on and so on. I can actually pass them to special uh, composition function that will, it will take the argument and pass it to the last one function the result will be passed farther farther and farther and yeah we will have the combination of these all functions and the pipe is the same but it's reverse in the order in which we read so for example in this case it would be if i pass some user id into this new function which is combination of the those uh, it would be get user log from database with this user ID, then with result filter from yesterday, then plug the messages and then count the words. Just like we have uh, in Unix, as you know, uh, the pipe pipes in Unix, when we have the results of functions, they uh, which, uh, well, they are just piped and the result of the first one is passed to result of, uh, to the second one and the result is passed to the third one and so on and so on. So uh, in function, uh, we have the pipe method for it uh, and let's see how it looks. Property H, again, you can see how it's uh, uh, declarative greater than 30. Okay, 35. So we have the functional function that is called older than 30 and it's a pipe of property, get the property age greater and then with all the, uh, all the objects that, wait a minute, it's not, it's not like this. It's like this. Okay. Sorry. Older than 30. Oh, yeah. That's right. I need to get property H and it should be greater than 35. Everything is right. So then I want to get name of the users and it would be property name. And then I want to combine those two functions or uh, compose them. Get name uh, older of older, oops, sorry, then 30. And pipe the filter of older than 30, right? And then I have to map the result and get the names. And let's try out this function. Ooh, ooh, let's take a look. Property greater than, yeah, it should work. Property name. Filter by older than and then map. Okay, I guess I, I would need to skip this because we, we, we're run out of time. Uh, but you get the idea, I, I just can't figure out why it doesn't work older than 30. It should work. I, I, I'm tired already, I think. Anyway, so you can see how I broke down this function into the smaller functions each of them do, does one thing and does it good. And I can like take every of this function and uh, test it uh, in isolation. So 
it's all about declarativeness because thanks to this piping or composing of functions, I can break down my application into the uh, functions that are really small and easy to understand. So I can read it like take the property H and take with the result, uh, take the H that is greater than 30, right? Or get name, get the, the property name and so on and here i can say i can see that take the filter the uh list of users that are older than 30 and map to get the names of the, them I, I just need to spend some more time okay so we're done with the uh theory part and so again, in functional programming, there is no need to protect, protect the state because everything is by default immutable. And behavior is clearly separated from data. You can see that we didn't use any class here, just the functions and just the uh, simple plain old JavaScript objects. No questions about inheritance and types of hierarchy, hence, right? Uh, Encourages declarativeness, we saw this. And may, we have many functions not tied to concrete data, data types. They are just functions. So the same technique can be applied to components. And even in yes and other frameworks, uh, starting from React, we have this concept of functional components. So we can treat the component as the function, actually. So. It, it takes the inputs or the arguments, right? Uh, and it has the outputs or the results of those, uh, the uh, results of functioning of this component. You can see the, you can check the uh, articles on this later. So for the functional components, we have the same idea. We have certain inputs and certain outputs. And inside of the component, we have certain transformations that uh, occur. And for the outputs are the outputs for uh, the Angular outputs, like event emitters, as well as the HTML template. So one of these output, one of these outputs is the HTML template rendering. And this idea of DOM to be equal to be result of applying certain fun function to data is actually at the at the core of React. So let's get back to Angular. And in Angular, we have this duality of functional programming and object-oriented programming approach. Angular promotes object-oriented approach. It has classes, inheritance, TypeScript, and so on. Everything to make JavaScript feel comfortable. But at the same time, Angular promotes the ideas of functional reactive programming by em embracing the power of RxJS. And it actually makes Angular outstanding framework out there because it's the only enterprise level framework that takes the functional reactive concepts as the core. So what is functional reactive programming? It's the sum of reactive programming and functional programming. So we already, already know about the functional programming. It's all about function composition. Everything is function. Everything is immutable. Uh, we have the pure functions. Uh, we have the side effects and we need to avoid them somehow. Uh, side effects is changing the outer state. It's actually, it's possible. And we uh, do this a lot in Angular. We forced to do side effects, but that's fine. I will show how to treat them. So reactive programming, the part that is unknown for us yet in this, uh, so far in this formula. So it's the declarative way of modeling systems that respond to input over time. It's like uh, to, to complicated uh, definition, so let's just dive in. The main abstraction in functional reactive programming is the observable or data stream. Uh, this term uh, varies uh, from framework to framework, but idea is that observable or stream is the value that change, changes in time. And the classical example for this is the Excel 
uh, tables and you, for example, you have uh, one uh, cell and you have the function that uh, is applied to other cells depending on this cell. And so you have this pure function here and you have this reactiveness here. Uh, those cells react on change, changing in this cell. So observable is like a promise that can execute multiple times. I hope, I really hope that you know what the promise is. And it's actually the way to say that this value is not available right now. We need to wait for it. Let's take a step back and dive more in theoretical part of the functional reactive uh, world. We said that functional programming focuses on operations instead of data types. And it's all about a function composition. In, as in all programming in general, we said, right? So functional programming actually provides some abstractions to deal with functional composition more effectively. For example, what if my function should be executed? What if my value for this function is not available right away? How should I compose my functions, right? And they thought about this, the creators of uh, functional programming paradigm for us, and they have something that's called a functors. Let's open the pictures and let's take a look at the wiki. So what is a functor? Functor is something that can, can be mapped over and something that has a map function, in other words. Let's take a simple function. It takes an argument and returns something. And let's say that this function runs in certain context. What is a context? You can imagine it as a box. So our value is in a box. And when we need to apply uh, a function to it, we need to open the box, extract the value, apply the function and close the box. So the box is like a classical way to imagine this, but it's not actually a box. Uh, yeah, the box. I, I uh, express it like this. So we have uh, argument in a box and we have result uh, also in a box. So this function takes the functor and returns the functor. So you already you already know what the functor is because array is of course the functor. Imagine it like the box with multiple sections and you have in each section you have a value and you map this box on certain function and you get another box with the same, uh, the same uh, sections but every value is transformed, right? So you apply the function and in this function you describe only how to transform the value but not how to deal with the box. And you can change those maps. So you can compose your functions while dealing with the box of array. The promise is also a box. And this box is special because it says that the, it's the box, the value of which is not available right now. It will be available afterwards. And you can chain the functions what to do with this value when it will be available afterwards. So you can chain with then, then, then. They call the map then here, but it should not obfuscate you. It's the map actually. And the promise is the functor. Okay, now the next one is observable. It's really uh, similar to promise. It also has the map. And let's say that, yeah, when we click, we say that when we click on something with the result, I need to map some function on it and I can then map, 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 and I can compose the functions to treat with this event that happens in time. So observable abstracts out uh, the computations for me when the computations are uh, asynchronous in time. So it's a box that helps me. It's a special box with the time mechanism, let's say so. And even the plain function is, it's the functor. Uh, observable is the functor and even the plain function is actually can be treated as a box. You can see that you can imagine it as a box which have a, a lot, a lot of sections. For every argument it has a result. So you put some, 
something in this box and you get the output. And the map for the function would be the function composition, which, which we talked about already. So you can think about this in your spare time. And yeah, it actually makes sense. When you map one function over other function, you actually compose those functions and you actually just r run the code the function with the results of the first function. So let's take a step farther and let's add a new concept to this functor box. When you can lift something in a box and flatten the box. So you have a value and you um, want to take it in a box or you have a box and you want to open it and take a value out of it. It's called lift and flatten. And this new abstraction is called monad. And here how we can show it. So you also, all of you already uh, dealt with it because in, uh, let's say that we have a promise and HTTP call and then we want to do something with this result. And afterwards we want to make another HTTP call with the result. And then we say that with the result of this another HTTP call, we need to make something else. So here we don't return just the value. Here we return the new HTTP call, the new uh, functor, right? But magically in this, uh, then afterwards we get it the result of this new call as just the value. So the box unwraps somehow for us behind the scenes. And same, same thing we have with the observables. I'm sure that you all dealt already with flat map. When we have HTTP call, we map the result somehow, and then we flat map it, flat map, or flatten and then map, to another HTTP call. And with result, we do something and then subscribe to it and so on and so on. So it means that monad, that uh, observable is actually a monad as well as a promise. So it's all about function composition. As you can see, the only thing that it helps us to do is to compose us our functions through map, flat map, and other set of operators. And thanks to functions and monads, we can compose functions that have certain context. Uh, I assure you that it's not limited to arrays and observables and uh, yeah, promise and everything that we discussed. There is a lot, a lot of monads and you can actually create your own if you want, but it's not the scope of our uh, topic today. Let's get back to the practical side. So thanks to this observable monad, you can actually treat your application as the combination of those observable abstractions. And let's say that I have a name, a high and weight. And I then I use the name to compose, to uh, generate a new completely new observable, uh, which is transform transformation of this name. And then I combine these two uh, observables into the third one. And then I combine everything into the result. So it will be, uh, let's say the short lower case name and the BMI calculated out of this. So I can like compose my application out of observable. And it's really cool. Also, you are already, I'm sure that you already encountered this from expressing yourself, uh, expressing the observables uh, is, is called the marble di diagram. You can see that, for example, here we have certain observable that emits and then I transform it and I get the resulting observable. So it's, again, the pattern is the same. We have the inputs, transformation and the output. So the traditional, uh, if you come from the imperative working, that way to use the, the service, you have the call and then you subscribe and then in subscribe function, you do the stuff like conditions, transformations, more conditions, more transformation and stuff. And it kind of works, but it's, it's not the FRP actually way. And it 
makes it hard to understand your intent and we lose all the benefits that functional programming gives to us. So here is the same, you can see this one, and here is the same exact function, but it's in an FRP way. So we subscribe only to the result of the transformations. We have the source, uh, the get data method of this service. Then I tap or do uh, the side effect. Tap is exactly to, for performing the side effect. It will just pass the data uh, stream farther without changing it and we'll do some side effects. Then I filter the result and map the result and map the result again. And then I subscribe uh, to the result, the final result. And only afterwards I mutate the state. So here I have pure functions in which I'm sure nothing bad happens, only transformations of data. And I can name them declaratively like uh, add name or add logged uh, logged in flag, something like this, to express my intention as much as I can and make it easy to understand for the reader. So let's take a look. We have, oh, sorry, we have the, we have the function structure here. Oh, no, not this. Okay, anyway, you you get the idea. So it's the same as for the pure functions. We have the inputs, transformations, and the outputs. Oh yeah, here it is. So uh, like an, in components also, we have the inputs, transformation, and outputs. And here we only add the reactive part uh, so that our inputs actually can be react, uh, observables and the transformations are uh, described in form of uh, operators of uh, RxJS and the outputs are uh, the HTML template and the event emitters. So functional programming versus object-oriented programming in Angular. We, now we can like apply everything that we know already from the theoretical point of view uh, on Angular. So I show once again this image of combining functions and object-oriented approach. We can find a sweet spot here uh, on intersection of those two approaches. So example one, the getters and setters, how we should treat them uh, in a functional uh, reactive way. So let's take a look. I have a section here about this. So yeah, please avoid using getters and setters at any cost while being something considered as okay by Angular team as many other object-oriented techniques. In GUT, we're trying to keep everything closer to functional programming in order to write clean code and reduce the amount of bugs. Getters and setters come from the Java world when we protect the mutable state of the class instance by making some parts of it private and exposing only uh, true special methods. So we have, let's say that we have class student and we have the name and we don't want anybody to change this name directly. We have the getter for it and the setter uh, to mutate it. But in Angular, actually, there is no direct need to make everything private in JavaScript. There is no need to create getters and setters to protect your state. In Angular, just make public everything that is used in the HTML template and private everything else. So it's really simple. And you don't even need to think about, well, how to compose your uh, stuff because uh, Angular already deals uh, with well, it provides the architecture for you. And when it comes to getters and setters in JavaScript, well, there is a common pattern when we, for example, need to change this name. Then, uh, but when changing it, we need to mutate it somehow and also call some side effect, right? And for this, we create this private name uh, property with the underscore to uh, signalize that it's private and we have the setter and we add something to this name while we setting it and call something and then when I do it like this like this name equals something it will run automatically this stuff and 
call this side effect, it's really, really not good because it will click quickly lead you to the uh, problems and bugs. How can we treat it with a functional reactive approach? We can treat our name property as the observable actually. So by default, it's empty string. We say that it's an observable input. And we say that we have another property, which is this name mapped to this transformation. And we have the side effect, which is we emphasize that it's a side effect thanks to the tab. And then in our template, we can use it like this using the async pipe uh, about which I will talk on a separate meeting dedicated to uh, RxJS in Angular. But the idea is that it flattens the observable for us. So name is observable, but as you can see, right? But in template, it unwraps and it template treats it just like a value, just a simple value right now, how it looks. And the same thing with the prefix. As we mapped the observable, it's also an observable, but thanks to this async pipe, we can treat it as just a plain value that doesn't change in time. It will just render the current value of this name with prefix. Okay, so you can see that it actually looks uh, much better than this. And you can already feel that this will lead you to a problems really quickly uh, comparing to this, because here you have the chain of the pure functions, nothing changes, uh, your side effects under control, and yeah, it won't break anything for sure. Uh, example two, the component methods. So in Angular, we need to change the state. The framework is built in that way uh, so that we need to call side effects because we need to change the properties of our uh, components on the fly sometimes. So I propose this function structure. We have the inputs of your function. Let's say that, that it's a method, for example. Then first you gather the transformation. So you take the inputs and transform it somehow and name it uh, in the declarative way so that the reader can uh, figure out what's going on. Then if needed, only, in, only if needed, in case of uh, very, very uh, critical need, you call the side effects. So you change the properties. But as you can see, it, uh, it's separated from the just transformation and the reader can see uh, that, okay, here I have some side effects, and then your function returns the result. Sometimes it might not return the result, but it sh generally it's, it should return something because your function should be a pure function that takes something and returns something, unless your function is designed only to mutate the state and it on, it's only to do side effects, then you can skip this part and leave only this part and note that your function is void. It won't return anything and it's actually fine in Angular. So this is how by separating this uh, on, uh, in code of our functions, transformation, side effects and outputs, we like, uh, we, uh, get all the benefits of the functional approach and as well as the uh, object-oriented approach that Angular actually promotes. Okay, example three uh, is about the class versus plain object. Actually, you can compare this to uh, variants. We have this pattern of using the class everywhere. And people just think that it's fine to use class everywhere. So for example, to mock something, I use the class. Well, actually, I could use just simple plain old JavaScript object by using use value method. Uh, regarding this, okay, and I, I, I told already about underscores in private properties that it's not good because we already have uh, private properties, private keyword in Angular, and there is no need uh, to use underscore. 
And let's talk about classes in JavaScript. I, I will move farther really quickly because we have around 10 minutes left. We said that functional programming focuses on operations instead of data, data types, right? And functional programming doesn't need classes and it, neither it needs uh, inheritance or encapsulation or polymorphism actually. Well, classical functional programming, just plain objects. And it, it makes everything just so much simpler. And this idea perfectly suits JavaScript because there is no such thing as class in JavaScript. So if you take a look at the JavaScript here, you can see that it's a, a prototype, it's object oriented, but prototype based. And if you take a look at one of the languages uh, that influenced JavaScript, it's self and here you have a whole section about prototype-based programming languages, that traditional class-based orient, uh, object-oriented languages are based on deep-rooted root, deep duality of classes and object instances, that we have classes that uh, act like blueprints and object instances that are instantiated from that cl classes, right? And actually, it's not so obvious, but it adds a lot, a lot of headache to us. So I have a link to a book that's called You Don't Know JavaScript, uh, uh, specifically uh, dedicated to object prototypes and this. And the main idea of this book, and as well as I assure you, the main idea of JavaScript is to avoid using classes because JavaScript has the, uh, the prototype way of object-oriented uh, design. And it actually de was designed to use this way. And in mod all modern uh, frameworks, we have this uh, imitation of classes. And actually it's not what the JavaScript was designed for. And even if ECMAScript 6, while we're using the class keyword, actually under the hood, it's a not a class. And there is no such thing as instantiation from the class in JavaScript. In JavaScript, we have just the plain objects out of the box, just the plain objects with the a prototype chaining. So one object can refer to other object as the prototype. So this guy here, the author of this book, uh, presents an example of to designing the same application in two approaches. The first one is the object-oriented class in classical way, trying to imitate it in JavaScript. And the second one is just the JavaScript way of doing this. I really encourage you to read this book, book because it really opens uh, your eyes on the topic of object-oriented approach in JavaScript. And it actually, it fits functional idea very much because uh, classes just make it hard to uh, reason about the functional ways of uh, approach. approach right? So unless you are totally sure, don't use the classes. Use plain object literals. So plain old JavaScript objects. Use classes only when Angular forces you to. In components, services, pipes, directives, mo modules, it's okay. Okay, that's fine, but remember, it's only a syntactical sugar. Under the hood, it's always plain old JavaScript, uh, plain old JavaScript objects plus prototypal delegation. In all the cases, you can achieve the same goal without using classes, just plain old JavaScript uh, objects. So just keep everything as simple as possible. If you feel like you can uh, avoid using classes, please avoid to use classes. Use just plain objects. It will be much simpler, clear for the reader and convenient for you, I assure you. You'll learn to love this approach, I assure you. So let's take a look once again, class versus plain object. We have the cl class here, and plain object here. And you can see that it's actually totally the same, but with class, you have this burden of thinking about it as a class. 
wow. while in reality under the hood in JavaScript there is no such thing. I assure you that it will make this approach will make your code much more easy to understand for everybody. So summary, what to do? Now when you know all this, uh, I'm sorry for a lot, a lot of information, but what to do? So first of all, read the docs. As you can see, I wrote a whole bunch of tutorials here about functional programming and code quality, some pictures. Please read them through and I, I constantly update them and it will be really helpful for you, I assure you. Break the logic into small pure functions so that each one does one thing and does it good. So it's from the Unix philosophy. Every function does one thing and does it good. If your function does more than one thing, please think, refactor, and make break it up into smaller functions and composition of these functions. So it will be really, really fluent to read this. Clearly separate the state mutation side effects from your functions. It's exactly what I showed the here. Uh, you can separate it like this. Here we have transformation, side effects separately and obvious and explicitly, and the output. Pick the names for your variables and functions uh, so it represents your intention as precise as possible. Uh, later, I will give the link on the book, which is called Clear Code, Clean Code by uh, Robert Martin, uh, all known as Uncle Bob. It's really, really cool book. And we have a free uh, JavaScript related version of it. Um, and there, Uncle Bob really, really stress this idea of proper naming. And I like this idea very much. And I uh, always say that uh, the 90% of your success is properly naming of your methods and your functions and your constants and variables. And this way you won't need any uh, commands and so on. So instead of when you're thinking about writing a command to your uh, function, please take a step back and think maybe you can just rename it to something more uh, self-explanatory. Use low dash uh, functional low dash as much as possible. Learn the curry way of thinking, learn the operators like map, filter and reduce in first place of course and all the other uh, methods from the tool belt. Uh, low dash is really powerful as well as Ramda of course and I'm pretty sure that you need to use it uh, in React, in Angular, it's just uh, uh, everywhere, right? Use RxJS at full force. Learn the operators such as map, filter, flat map, switch map, fork join, throttle, the bounce, combine latest, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, Please, my advice here is not to just sit and read through them one after another, another. but when you encounter some problem and you feel like you can uh, solve it in a functional reactive way, just Google it and learn this, those operators one by one on demand. So when you practice, please go ahead and learn it because it's the best way to learn this kind of uh, to build libraries like Lodash and RxJS because there is too much of operators, but by learning on practice, you will see that it, it gives you the result. Use ECMAScript 6 and 7, uh, like our arrow functions, spread operator, destructuring, and so on. I will provide you the literature, and we you can see that we use it a lot of in, in GUT, and I encourage the use of it very much because it's also about functional programming. Learn Redux and GRX. Uh, I will provide the introduction co course. It's totally free from uh, Dan Abramov, uh, creator of Redux. Because on one of our next uh, meetings, uh, such meetings, I will talk about Redux and GRX. And now when you know about functional programming fundamentals, it will be really easy for you to grasp everything else. And acknowledge yourself with one of classical functional programming languages. We used the functional programming techniques in GUT and we saw that it helped us. 
and let's proceed to do this. So I encourage you to learn this way of thinking, make this shift in your head from imperative to declarative functional way of thinking because we will only proceed to get, get ourselves aligned to angular and functional ways of uh, angular uh, like rxgs so that theory uh, here i provide some books they are totally free i encourage you to learn the one of the classical functional programming languages because it will make everything very much clear to you something might be not clear in javascript but there you will see that it totally makes sense of course lisp is the choice uh, um, here we have a good free uh, book on it it's about closure closure is the modern uh, dialect of lisp one of the best really really cool language it will make shift in your head very fast i i promise Next one is Haskell that I talked about already. You learn you a Haskell. It's a good book that everybody, really everybody should read, must read. Scala, um, it's about functional programming in Scala. Scala is, well, for Java programmers, it would be really interesting because Scala is basically, it's similar to Java. It also combines object-oriented and functional approaches. And yeah, it, it similar to JavaScript in this way. And it would be really, really uh, interesting for everybody. Unfortunately, this book is not free, but it's cool because it has uh, tasks uh, that you have to solve after each chapter to make sure that you got the idea, like for example, implementing the map to recursion and only the functions. So only pure functions implement your own map, your own filter and your own re reduce. And this is how you actually get the idea how it how it all works in in well in JavaScript also. Elm is the language which influenced the Redux pattern. That is really really uh, also it's everywhere these days. So, but nobody uh, well a lot, uh, not, not so much people know that it was influenced by elm actually and elm is a great language that is out there it compiles in javascript and it's really powerful and it one one of the variants to build of technologies to build the uh, front-end applications these days along with angular and uh, react so the literature about the functional programming is in JavaScript is a really, really great book. I know that somebody from our team from Romania, I believe, even bought it, bought it already. And yeah, I promise you, if it's not a commercial of any kind, author is not my friend, but I promise you that if you buy it, uh, you won't regret it. Uh, and that's, that's it. And also, yeah, yeah. It's a really great book. You don't know JS. Uh, huge chances that you actually don't know JS even if you are seasoned JavaScript developer. I really encourage you to take a look at this series of books. They are totally free and they are available on GitHub for you. Uh, highly recommended series of articles about functional programming in JavaScript. Some mathematical uh, stuff on category theory and functors and monads and so on. Functors in JavaScript, again, functors in monads. Well, yeah, functors in monads, it's a really cool topic because it's something that you can uh, talk with your friends about and uh, appear as a scientist of somehow, uh, scientist in some way, you know, really cool thing to, you know, uh, talk about with your friends. I really encourage you. Uh, clean code JavaScript version. It's a free version of clean, clean code by Uncle Bob. Really, really, uh, also really cool thing. Uh, totally free. Uh, ECMAScript 6 reference, getting started with Redux. I really, I ask you to uh, read about Redux and get yourself prepared to Redux because uh, we will talk about this next time. And there is a wall, yeah, and Google. Google it and discover the new stuff because there is a lot of stuff in the functional world. It's React, Elm, Cycle.js, Immutable.js, Ramda, Fantasyland, Sanctuary, PureScript, ClojureScript, Reframe, a whole bunch of front-end 
technologies that you didn't know know about but they are really really cool and they are much cooler than popular angular and react i assure you it's fascinating i don't know how is it for you but to me it's really fascinating because it's something really old and uh it's that ways of thinking tested by time it was even before the object-oriented approach and it's really cool yeah not only for me i hope so it would the next time we will talk about frp which uh, rx js redux with ngrx and re react maybe maybe uh yeah are you here guys still